On this episode of Boxing World Weekly, Fundora's lofty goals, weighty expectations, and a must-see matchup. Sebastian Fundora stands head and shoulders above the rest. Literally, the six foot five and a half super welterweight has quietly emerged as a top contender at 154 pounds. Yes, you heard that correctly. Some contenders catch the fans' attention because of their sheer knockout power, her awe-inspiring technique and finesse. But others not only have those qualities, but also ridiculous physical attributes. Fittingly, his nickname is the Towering Inferno. It's no surprise Fundora is often mistaken for a basketball player, but he'll quickly tell you he would rather dribble heads off the canvas instead of basketballs on the court. As a matter of fact, the whole Fundora family has taken up the sport, including Sebastian's older brother Alberto and his two younger siblings, Freddie Jr. and Gabriella. Boxing is in the Florida native's blood, and he knew it was his destiny after stepping into a boxing gym at the age of eight for the first time when he started training at his father's gym, which was nothing more than a converted office building. Fandor would begin his professional career in 2016 with an impressive 13 straight wins. This would include seven fights taking place inside of a calendar year in 2017 when he would move between light heavyweight and welterweight, signifying he hadn't figured out where he felt most comfortable. Fedor ultimately decided Super Welterweight was the division for him, and the 24-year-old would go on a five-fight knockout streak in a 17-month span. He would suffer his first setback in the form of a draw against his closest opponent in terms of height against Jermonte Clark. Fundora would bounce back on the undercard of Deontay Wilder Tyson Fury 2 with a dominant unanimous decision win over 2016 Olympian Daniel Lewis. The future looked bright for the towering inferno as he would enter a WBC title eliminator against 11-year veteran Jorge Cota. Fandora would secure a knockout in the fourth that was mostly fought inside the pocket, which might be hard to believe he'd do that with an 80-inch reach. Believe it or not, that's where this giant feels most comfortable, trading shots on the inside and using his long frame to rip powerful punches upstairs and downstairs. The Southpaw would look to get even closer to a title shot when he would take on one of his most experienced challengers, 33-0, Sergio Garcia. This time, Fandora would change up his game plan from the previous fight, putting his incredible reach on display to highlight his boxing abilities. Garcia was no match for Fandora as he handed him his first pro loss with another unanimous decision win. In less than six years, Fandora would work his way to the number two position in the WBC and challenge number one contender Erickson Lubin, whose only loss came from the undisputed super welterweight champion Jermel Charlo. People who previously questioned Fandora's chin, this fight against Lubin certainly answered those questions. He looked strong early, dropping Lubin in the second. The former world title challenger would respond in the seventh, knocking the towering inferno down for the first time in his pro career. But, Fandora wouldn't shy away from the adversity, instead he'd rise up and earn a ninth round stoppage that left Lubin's face a swollen mess. Fandora earned his biggest victory to date, and will now headline his first Showtime event this Saturday night, to take on his next test in another once defeated fighter, Carlos Ocampo, with that only loss coming at the hands of Errol Spence Jr. back in 2018. Since then, he has gone 12-0 with nine stoppages. And Fandora's sister Gabriella will also be featured on the card for the first time in their pro careers. At only 24 years of age, Fandora has shown he has all the abilities of being one of the most dominant big men in the sport. Now, he is showing he's not only physically head and shoulders above the rest, but his skills might be too. If you love the fights, make sure to check out more Boxing World Weekly exclusives on YouTube. Full fights, extended interviews, and everything else a fight fan could want. Coming up on Boxing World Weekly, the finest fighting families, and Stevenson's ultimate test.
on September 22, 2022. Unified Super Featherweight Champion Shakur Stevenson was preparing to step on the scale for his 130-pound defense against Robson Conceso in his hometown of Newark, New Jersey. From right here in Newark, New Jersey, Shakur Stevenson! He weighed 1.6 pounds over the limit and had the option of trying to cut the extra weight in a two-hour time span or vacate his titles. He chose the latter. When something like this happens in boxing, not only do the belts become vacant and only the challenger can win them, but most of the time, both teams head to the negotiation table to decide how much the champion is going to have to pay the challenger for not making weight. For bigger fights, it's sometimes already in the contract, but a lot of the time, it isn't. This needs to be fixed, and the Stevenson event proved why. At around 3 in the afternoon, Shakur's team and Robson's team would begin negotiations. And usually, this process doesn't take too long, considering clearly someone was at fault and both parties would rather spend their time rehydrating for the fight the next night. But that's not what happened here. They didn't come to an agreement on how much of Stevenson's purse would go to Conceso until almost midnight. That is ridiculous. Sanctioning bodies have all these rules set in place that barely anyone can keep track of, but they don't have something set for how much a champion should pay a challenger for missing weight? It's simple. Come up with a set percentage value of the champ's purse that they automatically have to give the challenger if they come in over the limit, and then have it in tiers depending on how much they weigh over. For example, between 0.1 and 1 pound, let's say 10%. For 1.1 to 2, 20%, and so on. It shouldn't be a negotiation. The champ shouldn't have a say. And people might go, well, what if it's a unification fight? For starters, it would be in the sanctioning body's best interests to have just the same rules so fighters don't prefer belts over others. But if they did have different percentage values, then the commission should come up with the percent that meets in the middle of all of them. This isn't rocket science. Fighters should be signing contracts already aware of what's at stake if they don't make weight. If anything, that would make them want to make it even more because they already know the repercussions. They shouldn't have the freedom of being able to negotiate it after the fact. On top of this, Boxing World Weekly was told that the reports about how much Stevenson did give up to Conceso and how much the challenger was making in the first place weren't even accurate. At least if these rules were set in place, fans and media members would know what percentage was being handed over. Stevenson stated he tried his hardest to make the weight, and he just couldn't. He spoke about how he should be held accountable, that he wishes he was able to make it, and most of the time, that's how the majority of fighters feel when they miss weight. So, establishing rules surrounding it should be fairly easy. This Saturday, the entire United Kingdom will come to a stop. 20,000 fans will file into the O2 Arena in London, and millions of people around the world will witness two world-class fighters follow in their father's footsteps to settle a rivalry that started 30 years ago. In honor of that massive fight, this week's top five are the five current best father-son legacies in the sweet science. Starting things off is one half of that fight that's taking place this weekend. His dad, Nigel Ben, was a two-division world champion who was best known for his power and aggression, just like his son, Connor Ben. He has worked his way up to one of the best welterweight contenders and now wants to take the risk of jumping up two weight divisions to even the score with his father's greatest rival, all for the legacy of the Ben name. The next bequest is the current and former opponents, the Eubanks, Chris Jr. and Chris Sr. The father is nicknamed simply the best, who was also a two weight champ and passes down his world class abilities to his son. Eubank Jr. was one or two fights away from going after another world title shot, but instead chose to take the risk of weighing in at a weight he's never made in his pro career, just to, in his words, keep the Eubank name ahead of Ben in the history books. Chris Eubank Jr. versus Connor Ben, as the third installment of Eubank versus Ben, is what boxing is all about, from generations on to the next. Sticking with father-son middleweight legacies, next up are the Hearts, Eugene and Jesse. The father, Eugene, may have never won a world title and fell short in his biggest fights, but 
That didn't matter when it came to the Ring Magazine naming him to the top 100 greatest punchers of all time. His son Jesse is a former world title challenger and remains a contender at super middleweight or light heavyweight. He has fought for world titles twice and just like his father fallen just short. But to have these two even get to similar levels in the same sport is impressive in its own right. The runner up for the best father son legacy in boxing today is the famous Chavez's. Julio Cesar Chavez Sr. and Jr. The former is one of the greatest fighters of all time and one of, if not the best Mexican fighter to ever step in the ring, and not to mention a Hall of Famer. His son has followed in the footsteps by becoming a former world champion himself at middleweight. Father and son both getting to the top of the mountain to carry on the greatest aim in boxing for Mexico. The best father and son legacy in the sweet science today are the zoos, Costa and Tim. The father Costa is a former undisputed king at super lightweight and is another Hall of Famer. His son Tim is one of the top super welterweight contenders who's on the cusp of a world title shot against the current undisputed king Jamel Charlo in early 2023. From a past king to potentially a current one, the zoos have the best father-son legacy in boxing right now. Boxing can be a family business. There are countless stories of fighters following in the footsteps of their parents or siblings and hopping into the squared circle. Some become more successful than their inspirations, and some do not. In this week's Boxing World Weekly Trivia, we want to know, who is the first father and son duo to both become world champions? The answer later on. If you love the fights, make sure to check out more Boxing World Weekly exclusives on YouTube. Full fights, extended interviews, and everything else a fight fan could want. After the break on Boxing World Weekly, the new kid on the block, and a high-tech battle. Welcome back to Boxing World Weekly. Before the break, we asked, who was the first father and son duo to both become world champions? The answer, Floyd Patterson and Tracy Harris Patterson. The legendary gentleman of boxing and two-time undisputed heavyweight champion, Floyd, first captured a world title when he knocked out Archie Moore in 1956. 36 years later, his adopted son Tracy stopped Terry Jacob to capture the WBC World Super Bantamweight Championship, making the Pattersons the first father-son duo to both become world champs. Tracy would also capture a title at Super Featherweight. Boxing World Weekly speaking with Super Welterweight contender Kevin Ajarko. Where did the passion for boxing start for you? I joined obviously boxing when I was seven years old and um, I kind of just obviously grew up um, fighting and yeah, once I kind of understood the, the sport a bit better, um, yeah, I just loved it and um, loved fighting and, and training and stuff. Obviously before I turned professional, um, I, in 2018 I, I was stabbed um, down the side of my face and, and neck um, in, in uh, 2017 and yeah, it was one of them ones where uh, I was just I just won a national to, uh, an international tournament and a week later I was out with my my ex-girlfriend and um, yeah I unfortunately I was attacked by 30 people and I got stabbed down the side of my face neck and I was an inch from death so um, obviously it was an, an unfortunate um, thing to happen to me but thankfully I'm still here and um, I pursued my, my, my boxing career and, and stayed positive and and um, just, just got back in the ring and kept fighting. Now, where did the nickname Black Thunder come from? Um, it's, actually <laughs> a, it's actually a funny story. One of my friends, um, when I look back on it now, so I used to, I fought in the WSB. I'm not too sure you're familiar with that. They don't do it anymore, but it's World Series of Boxing. I fought for the Italian Thunders and I just won, I just won um, 
against France and I come I'd come home and one of me and my friends were out for a couple a couple drinks and just that night he started calling me Black Thunder and <laughs> I kind of put it down to a drunken that like, can being drunk but I said to him like that's going to be my boxing name but when I look back now and when I look back on it now it's kind of like maybe he got that from me fighting for the Italian Thunders and that's why he called me Black Thunder but I actually haven't questioned him on that I'll give him his praise he called me Black Thunder and it's stuck ever since you won a super welterweight regional title in your last fight. Would you consider that guy your toughest test to date? Um, yeah, so it was actually for the WBA and the national office. It was my first fight before. I'd won, won one at 160, but yeah, I think on paper it was my toughest fight, not physically. I think my toughest fight was probably my seventh fight against, or sixth fight against Jez Smith. Six for, six for seven fight against Jez Smith. That was, that was my toughest fight for me, but on paper, the my last fight against Maciej, that, that was my toughest fight. Um, he, he was a solid opponent, um, 28 and four, never been stopped, fought Anthony Furler and stuff like that. So yeah, he, he was a tough opponent. Obviously, uh, after com campaigning at one, 160, um, I, I probably would like to go up and, and um, and win a world title at, at 160 and, um, and be a two-weight world champion. But for now, um, my, my goal is to be the first Black Harris world champion. Um, once I cross that bridge, then I'll, I'll set new goals. But yeah, I think being, being a two-weight two world champion would, would be a, a great achievement. If you love the fights, make sure to check out more Boxing World Weekly exclusives on YouTube. Full fights, extended interviews, and everything else a fight fan could want. Up next on Boxing World Weekly, Super Bantamweight's best, and a fan favorite fantasy fight. Picking the best character in any video game is tough, but usually people pick the fastest, strongest, and essentially, most overpowered. In this video game called Must See Matchups, the top characters would be Vasily Lomachenko and Shakur Stevenson. The game type would be 135 pounds. The tutorials on both these fighters' amateur careers are unskippable. Player 1, Lomachenko, a man who could be Stevenson's rival like Scorpion to his Sub-Zero, Loma has the highest score for amateur wins by getting 396 to just one loss, which he avenged twice. Representing Team Ukraine, one target on his crosshair was the 2008 Olympics, where he won gold in the featherweight division. From there, he gained a power-up and entered the 2012 Olympics as a lightweight, not slowing him down, winning gold once again. Player 2, Stevenson, won multiple youth world championships and silver at the Olympic Games in Rio for Team USA. In the pro ranks, Stevenson got to the top with his OP tactician-like play, mixed with his speed and power. It's like he has a third-person view of his fights and with that, can predict his opponent's next move. He captured his first world title by besting his first boss, Joe Gonzalez, and then moved up to super featherweight, beating then WBO champion Jamal Herring to become a two-division world champion in just his 16th fight. His toughest level to date was his first unification match against then unbeaten WBC world champion Oscar Valdez, who showed the world he can land critical strikes on anyone like he did to longtime champion Miguel Burchelt. Stevenson made Valdez look like he just picked up a controller and started button mashing like he has never played a boxing game before. That made it clear that Stevenson was the man to beat at Super Featherweight. After that, he handily defeated the man who almost beat Valdez, Robson Conceso. But because he could no longer make 130, he is now moving up to lightweight and needs that rival, someone who can really test his game mechanics. Loma became pro in 2013 and started speed running through his career by becoming a world champion in just his third professional fight, tying the record for fastest to do so. It didn't stop there. He became a two division world champ in seven professional fights and became a three division title holder in 12 pro fights by besting Jorge Linares, Jose Pedraza, and Luke Campbell to become the unified lightweight champ. Then he met his match when he fought Tiafima Lopez, losing by unanimous decision. 
but that didn't cause him to rage quit. In fact, he has continued to chase max level, and from there, he has won his last two matchups against Masayoshi Nakatani and former world champion Richard Comey. He has one more level in front of him before he could meet Stevenson, though. On October 29th, he takes on undefeated contender Jermaine Ortiz. Both Stevenson and Loma are multi-division champions and accomplished it without cheat codes. They have respect for the game by showcasing near tactical level precision in punching and absolute game-defining play defensively. Stevenson needs that rival, like Ryu and Bison in Street Fighter, someone able to push him over the edge where only a double jump can save him. Loma may be older, and the health bar might not contain all the hearts, but he is still a boss Stevenson can't afford to skip. He needs that XP to give him a push into the Hall of Fame ranks. These two are completionists, destined to meet, and the time is now. Get this fight a release date so boxing fans can win as two of the best characters in the sport. Go at it in this must-see matchup. Here are this week's top five super bantamweights. Zolani Tete, Raiz Alim, Luis Neri, Mirajan Akhmadalev, Stephen Fulton. Our fighter of the week is Zolane Tete. The former two division world champion made waves at his new weight when he battered Jason Cunningham in July and will look to gain three division gold in the very near future. And that's it for another round of Boxing World Weekly. Until next time, enjoy the fights.